Hello, I'm Hazm Seeker. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, three decades after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Putin's Russia is engaging with Africa to increase more than its political clout. The missile systems that could still upend Turkey's economy. We look at the economics behind the S-400 and the F-35 stealth bomber. And as Google prepares to launch its challenger in the games industry, we find out if it could be game over for the likes of Sony and Microsoft. So as the Soviet Union imploded, it turned its back on the African continent in the 1990s. But now, under President Putin, Russia is making a push to engage. The reason is simple. Western sanctions, the pivot to China hasn't been a huge success, and hopes of billions of dollars in investment from the Middle East haven't arrived in the quantities expected. Plus, African votes count in the United Nations. Russia's trade with Africa rose 26% to $17.4 billion in 2017. Moscow doesn't have the financial power of Beijing. Just in 2017, trade with Africa amounted to $170 billion. The U.S. is, of course, worried. Its trade with sub-Saharan Africa was $39 billion in 2017. And this is what Russia is doing in Africa. It has oil and gas deals with Algeria, Egypt, Ghana, Nigeria, and Mozambique. It has nuclear deals in place with Rwanda, Zambia, and South Africa, although that is in limbo. While it is a big supplier of arms to Egypt, Algeria, Sudan, and Angola, Moscow is increasing support across the continent. Now, that's not a comprehensive list by any means, but let's get more on Russia's interest in Africa. Now joining me from London is Charles Robertson, chief global economist and head of macro strategy at uh, Russian investment bank Renaissance Capital. Thanks very much for being with us. So let me ask you first of all then, how is uh, Russia's relationship with Africa changing under Putin? And, and what's the most important aspect of it? Is it political, economic or, or military influence? Well, I think there's a little bit of all three. But you take the first five, ten years of Putin's uh, rule in Russia, very little focus on Africa, uh, very little interest. What seems to have shifted is, is with the sanctions getting imposed by the US and the EU in 2014-15, we've then seen Russia decide that it needs to build links around the world, to China, to India, the Gulf, and we're seeing that with the Saudis, and, and now to Africa too. Um, and does, Russia doesn't have the, the, the financial firepower of China, though, does it? Can, can it really compete? I mean, is this, is this a competition or, or does he just need uh, friends for, for, for votes in the United Nations? I think it's about finding any export opportunity that they can. Um, they're not 100 percent sure how relations are going to pan out with the US or with the EU over the next five to ten years. And so what we've seen is a concerted effort by Putin to bring in uh, the Indian prime minister, the Japanese prime minister, the Chinese leadership, and now African leaders too, to, to diversify the Russian trade export routes. Um, and, and Africa's boomed in the last few years for Russia. Um, its exports to Africa were just 1% a few years ago. They're now running at 4%. And I think that's caught the Russians' attention. And how do you think China, Europe and the United States are, are, are seeing this Russian comeback? I was in uh, Congo last week, um, and, and the Russians are heavily involved in Central African Republic, which is the country just to the north, just over the border. Um, and I think there's a degree of uh, suspicion uh, about that. Uh, but so far, you know, apart from these isolated incidents in just one or two countries, um, most of Russia's engagement with Africa has been North Africa. Uh, so nearly 80% of all trade that Russia does, all exports, go to Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria. Um, this is, so, so the Russians are trying to, to spread south. Um, I think the West is much more concerned by China uh, at the moment and their engagement. And they're, they're only beginning to pay attention to what Russia might be doing. And uh, Putin is, is hosting this uh, Russian-African summit in Sochi next October. W what can we expect there? I think uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of leaders will turn up. Um, they are also conscious that Russia might have something that they need. Um, so one in seven of Russian exports to Africa are arms and weapons. Um, and, and just getting security 
uh, continues to be a big issue. And you see that in the Central African Republic. You see that in Somalia um, and, and other countries, South Sudan. Security remains an issue for, for some countries in the continent. And Russia's got the experience in uh, dealing with difficult climates, um, of, of running railway lines you know, around the world, um, infrastructure, electricity, education. Uh, a lot of Africans used to get educated in Russia in, in the Soviet times, and they're coming back now in the last five to ten years because the Russian population is shrinking. The number of young people is, is down by about 40 percent in Russia. So the universities are empty. Uh, how do you fill those spaces? Get African students to come in, and, and, and that's exactly what's happened. The numbers have doubled in the last 10 years. And what about African markets? What can they offer uh, Russian investors? Mining, oil, gas, that sort of thing? Yeah, you've already got Rosneft, uh, the, the oil giant, which is uh, oil and gas giant, which is, which is operating in north, just off the Egyptian uh, shore, in the, in the offshore uh, gas fields there. Uh, you've got Gazprom operating. You've got Rusal, which is building mines in, in Guinea. Um, and, and Euralchem, the, the fertilizer company, um, is, is seeing great opportunities in places like Zambia and Zimbabwe um, and thinks that it can, can help the agricultural revolution that Africa is going to need uh, to, to develop. Uh, so there's, there's opportunities for a whole host of Russian businesses in the continent. But Russia's economy isn't doing too well at the moment, is it? I mean, 0.5% uh, uh, growth in the first quarter. What, what can we expect going forward, do you think? The, the, the thing, the problem Russia's got, and which many people don't uh, focus on enough, is the population shrinking, uh, the working age population shrinking. So it's been dropping by about 1% a year. So when Russia's been getting about 2% growth a year, that's 3% per person. That's actually better than most countries. Uh, and Russia's, uh, in, in compare it to oil exporters like Canada or Norway in developed markets, or Colombia, or Qatar, or Saudi in emerging markets, Russia's done better in the last three years um, than, than its peers. But it, it does get capped. You, you're not going to get growth much above 2 to 3% when your population's shrinking. Um, and this year, they've also done tax hikes, and that's why we've seen the slowdown early this year. They're determined to keep the budget balanced to try and keep themselves secure against potential sanctions risk from the West. And just finally, I want to ask you about the, uh, the OPEC meetings this week. Uh, why has Russia signed up to extending oil production cuts? I mean, remarkably, it doesn't, it doesn't need higher oil prices, and it's built up this $100 billion rainy day fund. Yeah, they, they don't need it, um, but obviously they benefit when, when the oil price is higher. Um, and I think they're trying to play the long game. Um, so, so Putin's point a month ago was very much that, based on the, the way they're calculated in Russia, Russia can, can get oil out more cheaply than Saudi Arabia. Or, actually, that's not quite right. The budget um, balances um, at a lower oil price in Russia than it does in Saudi. Um, so the Russians are playing a long game, and they're happy to cooperate with the Saudis. And, and to try and ensure that oil prices don't do that terrible plunge down to the 30s, that would require big shifts in, in Russian policy making again. Good to speak to you, Charles Robertson. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the prospect of further US sanctions on Turkey over its decision to buy Russia's S 400 missile technology have been delayed for now. President Trump blamed the Obama administration for the impasse, saying Turkey had been treated unfairly by not being allowed to buy Patriot missiles. The president was not allowed to buy the Patriot missiles. So when he bought the other ones, the S-200s or 400s, uh, when he bought them, uh, he wanted to do this, but he wasn't allowed by the Obama administration to buy them until after he made a deal to buy other missiles. So he buys the other missile, and then all of a sudden they say, well, you can now buy our missile. You, don't, you can't do business that way. It's not good. Turkey has been a, a friend of ours, and they've done, we've done great things together. We're a big trading partner. We're going to be much bigger. I think the $75 billion is small. I think it's going to be well over $100 billion soon. Well, Turkey stood to be tipped back into recession just months after escaping the last one if sanctions were imposed. Turkey agreed to buy the S-400 missile batteries for $2.5 billion from Russia. Washington isn't happy that at least 13 nations are interested or are buying the missile defense system, including India, Vietnam, and Egypt. But delivery of its first four F-35 warplanes has been delayed over concerns its security may be compromised 
by the S-400 missile. Each plane is worth about $85 million, and Turkey has ordered 100 F-35s. Ankara has invested more than $1.25 billion in the F-35 program since 2002. More than 900 Turkish companies stood to lose participation in the building of the F-35. Over the lifetime of the plane, they stood to make $12 billion. Well, joining me now via Skype from Istanbul to talk more about this is Sinan Ulgen. He is the chairman of the Istanbul-based Center for Economics and Foreign Policy Studies and a visiting scholar at Carnegie Europe in Brussels. Thanks very much for being with us. Now, despite President Trump's comments at the G20, word from the Pentagon and Washington is that nothing has changed and that these uh, sanctions will go ahead if Turkey takes delivery of the S-400. What do you make of that? Well, after the meeting between the Turkish President uh, Erdogan and US President Trump in Osaka, uh, there was uh, an area of optimism in Turkey, an expectation that the US President could use his presidential prerogatives uh, to uh, either block uh, or suspend uh, potential uh, sanctions against Turkey. Uh, but obviously, we also know uh, that uh, the different pillars of the US administration and also Congress uh, is uh, very much in intent on imposing those sanctions. Uh, but uh, it remains to be seen to what extent uh, Trump can actually deliver on his promise made to the Turkish president at the margin of the G20 summit. Uh, to actually uh, prevent uh, or block uh, these potential sanctions. And is it true that uh, Trump's predecessor, President Obama, denied access to uh, Patriot uh, missiles? What, what's behind that decision? Well, it's let's say it's a half-truth, uh, in the sense that, yes, those Patriots were not delivered to Turkey, but uh, that, that because there was a disagreement uh, about the conditions of their delivery. So it was not a categorical rejection, uh, but uh, Turkey wanted that uh, purchase to be accompanied by a degree of technology transfer. And that's not what uh, the U.S. Uh, was prepared to accept uh, under the Obama administration. And therefore, the deal went through. It didn't go through. And what would happen then if Turkey decides not to take delivery of the S-400? What would be the consequences? Well, I mean, now uh, the Turkish government has uh, iterated so many times that the S-400, uh, that Turkey was intent on the purchase of the S-400, that it would be difficult to explain to the Turkish public opinion why at the last moment uh, the government has decided to opt uh, for a different scenario. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I think that if there is uh, a diplomatic solution to this problem, uh, that would enable uh, the Turkish government uh, to explain in a convincing manner to the Tur Turkish audience why uh, they have ultimately made that decision, that this would be the best way forward because it would then diffuse the political tension with the United States uh, and uh, still allow Turkey to acquire this time around the Patriot system. What would be the impact on that for the Russians then? Well, Turkey will have to manage the relationship with Moscow if Turkey at the last moment decides not to acquire the S-400. Uh, here, I think we should underline that uh, Moscow uh, would have two potential objectives associated with that sale. The first one, obviously, is a financial one where Turkey would still be committed to pay uh, the amount agreed. But secondly, Russia probably also uh, wants, uh, by way of this sale to Turkey, uh, lead to an escalation between Turkey and the United States, which would also have an impact on NATO and NATO's cohesion. So uh, in that sense, if Turkey uh, goes ahead and decides uh, not to acquire the S-400, uh, then uh, at least Turkey would uh, probably need to compensate Russia for the financial loss. Uh, because uh, the leverage that Russia has on Turkey nowadays is uh, about Syria, in particular in Idlib, where uh, Turkey is afraid that a, a uh, heavy-handed intervention by uh, the regime, backed by Russia, uh, could lead uh, to a new wave of refugees, uh, this time from Idlib. So that's the leverage, and uh, for that, uh, Turkey needs to uh, be diplomatic about it, 
uh, and essentially compensate Russia for any financial loss. And if, if the U.S. were to go ahead with sanctions uh, on Turkey, what, what could the imp impact of that be uh, on Turkey? Because this, of course, is not the first time the U.S. and Turkey uh, have had difficult relations. There was the whole uh, episode with the U.S. Uh, pastor as well. Yes, indeed. We've seen uh, last summer the threat of sanctions, although sanctions were not applied, but even the threat of sanctions was enough to destabilize the Turkish economy. Now, uh, if the U.S. goes ahead uh, with the Katsa sanctions, uh, that is likely to have uh, an impact uh, on the Turkish economy by raising uh, Turkey's uh, risk uh, perception. Uh, so that's really the main economic impact. Uh, but be, uh, beyond that, uh, this will have also implications for Turkey's defense industries. Uh, it's going to make it more difficult for Turkish companies to cooperate with, the, with their U.S. counterparts. Uh, and thirdly, uh, this will also have an impact on the F-35 program, whereby the U.S. Uh, has clearly stated that if the S-400s come to Turkey, uh, the U.S. will stop the delivery of the F-35 uh, aircraft to Turkey, but also exclude Turkish uh, defense companies from uh, the production line uh, of, uh, of the F-35. So there are many different aspects uh, of, uh, or many municipal tracks of uh, possible impact uh, if, the, uh, if the U.S. goes ahead with the uh, Katsa sanctions against Turkey. And if we look at the domestic uh, political situation in, in Turkey right now, uh, President Erdogan's party recently lost uh, the Istanbul election, the mayoral election there. What's the potential impact of that going to be on Erdogan's approach to, to running the economy in Turkey? Well, um, I mean, short term, little in the sense that this was at the end of the day a local election, so it does not really impact uh, the overall uh, national uh, distribution of power in Ankara. Erdogan continues to be uh, the executive president of the country, uh, and, and therefore uh, he will continue to dictate uh, a Turkish policy. But of course, uh, losing Istanbul is a major setback, uh, and a lot of that is certainly due to the uh, economic slowdown uh, that we have witnessed uh, in the past uh, couple of quarters uh, in, in Turkey. So uh, the direct impact of this will be uh, for the government to refocus on the economy uh, and try to uh, create a, a reform agenda uh, for a faster recovery. And, but that will also uh, be uh, very much dependent on the evolution of Turkey's uh, set of foreign policy goals. And there, an escalation with the United States would certainly hinder uh, this path towards faster recovery. Sinan Ulgen, good to talk to you. Thank you. Now, Xbox, PlayStation, and Nintendo have dominated the video game industry for the last decade and more. Sony's next generation console will be available around December 2020, and it's about to focus on hardcore gamers. That decision shouldn't come as a surprise. The big three have carved up a chunk of the $135 billion industry for themselves. By 2025, it could be worth $300 billion. And that is why some of tech's biggest players are about to introduce rival services. Alphabet, the parent of Google, plans to launch its Stadia platform in November this year. Stadia will be streamed from the cloud and does away with expensive consoles. And Apple will introduce its Arcadia service. It's estimated that more than 2.5 billion people play computer games every year, and esports enjoy an audience of 458 million a year. So, can Google and Apple make a dent in the games industry? Well, joining me now from Oxford, England, is Vili Ledenverter, Associate Professor and Senior Research Fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute, part of the University of Oxford. Thanks so much for being with us. So can Google and Apple uh, change the gaming industry then? Well, first of all, I'd, I'd say that they already have once. Um, Apple App Store and Google Play Store popularized mobile gaming and the microtransaction and advertising revenue models for games. Um, and today, something close to half of all the revenues in the global games industry 
come from mobile gaming. So I'd say that they already have revolutionized the games industry once. Now, as for um, Google Stadia and uh, Apple Arcade, I'd say that it appears to me that Apple Arcade is um, more of a, a, a sort of complement to their existing offerings, a subscription service, uh, perhaps for parents who are concerned about letting their uh, kids on a marketplace with microtransactions where they might end up spending too much money or for um, uh, professionals who want to just play some games every month without uh, spending too much time browsing the marketplace. Um, whereas Google Stadia appears to be a much more uh, ambitious effort um, at something that is called platform envelopment, uh, which means that they uh, appear to be uh, attempting to uh, become the customer interface, to become the platform between the, the, the buyers um, and developers uh, of games and relegate the hardware manufacturers to the role of, of dumb pipes, essentially infrastructure, which is what Google has been uh, thus far. So they're trying to envelop um, the, the existing platforms and become a platform of their own. And what about Sony? It's, it's aiming its uh, next console at hardcore uh, gamers and it sees itself as a niche player. What do you make of that strategy? Well, uh, I, I think that niche is probably still very viable because if you think about the first uh, revolution that I referred to, mobile gaming, uh, those, you know, the mobile games market is now half of the games industry, but the rest of the games industry is still there. It didn't go anywhere, so it, it, the total size of the market uh, grew. So it's very possible that there is still um, a niche uh, for those hardcore, hardcore gamers who value uh, cutting-edge uh, graphics hardware and so on. Because one of the problems for uh, something like Google Stadia, a cloud uh, gaming system, is is lag lag between controller inputs and uh, visual feedback on the screen google state is by no means the first cloud gaming startup uh, even sony has playstation now which is a cloud-based system but the problem with those services has been that the lag between the 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 controller and the visual feedback has been uh, a little bit distracting, it's been too high because it takes time for the signal to propagate to the data center and back. Now Google thinks that because they have lots of data centers around the world that they're able to cut this lag to an acceptable amount. Um, but I think that what may happen is that there's still going to be a niche for those gamers who really want to play uh, hardcore first person shooter games or esports where the lag, having a small lag is extremely important and they will want to have cutting edge hardware locally at their homes and perhaps uh, perhaps Sony is targeting that niche. And game makers would like to to sell their games across all uh, the platforms. I mean that, that makes sense doesn't it? Yes uh, although it can be helpful for a game maker to get more attention to stand out in the marketplace if they get that extra marketing push from um, a platform um, with whom they have an exclusive launch deal with. And what technologies then should we be looking out for? How, how will they change the industry, do you think? Well, in terms of technologies, new technologies changing the industry, there's of course um, a lot of talk about VR uh, and now Google Stadia's cloud gaming and it remains to be seen whether they can solve that problem of lag in cloud gaming. But I would actually highlight two technologies on the production side, under the, under the hood, so to say. So one is motion capture. It's becoming cheaper to capture 3D motions from actors and transfer those onto um, 3D characters. And the other is AI-based character animation. So animating characters in a, a partly automated fashion. And that's making the production side of games cheaper and potentially allowing, reducing the entry barriers, increasing competition and allowing higher quality games to be produced at lower cost. Willi Lerdenbetter, thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. And that is our show for this week. Remember, you can get in touch with us by tweeting me at HazemSeeker and do use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. Or drop us an email, countingthecost at aljazeera.net is our address. And as always, there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, 
and entire episodes for you to catch up on. So that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Hazem Seeker from the whole team here. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.